Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a Scottish history and folklore podcast. I'm Jenny, your ghostly tour guide, and just so you know, tipping is expected. And I'm Annie, your mad evil baker. Today we are visiting a marvellous monument, Huntley Castle. This ruined structure sits in Aberdeenshire in the north of Scotland and I visited it just a couple of weeks ago in beautiful sunshine with a friend. Huntley Castle has a rich heritage and an exceptionally eventful history. Huntley itself is a great town to visit, especially for tourists. There's a large shortbread centre that will meet all of your buttery biscuit requirements and there's a good few distilleries in the vicinity. And I have to say, Speyside whiskies are my favourite because they're the lightest on my little palate. At the castle itself, there's a sign that says this is not really one building, but rather the site is a story of three castles or four castles, depending on how you count your castles. Now that's because there are multiple different layers of architecture from multiple different time periods. Now when I wandered around the ruins, my friend and I just kept stopping and looking in absolute amazement at the different and distinct elements of the buildings. Historic Environment Scotland, who care for the ruin, describe it as a truly magnificent ruin in an impressive setting. It is among the finest examples of Scottish Renaissance architecture. All right. Bold claims. Bold claims from Historic Environment Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to get exploring. Shall we have a wee message from our advertisers and then jump into medieval Aberdeenshire? Yes, let's go. Annie, of all the lovely listeners listening right now, how many do you think like learning about the language, heritage, archaeology, literature, landscape, identity, folklore and magic of Scotland's Highlands and Islands? Every single one. Well, do I have a course for all of you lovely listeners? Because the University of the Highlands and Islands Culture and Heritage BA Honours course is an interdisciplinary degree that explores all of these topics and more. This degree is an incredible opportunity to gain a deep understanding of the rich heritage that has built this region. It's offered as an online course and internationally accredited. So no matter where you are in the world, near or far, land or sea, this course is a path to understanding the beating heart of the Highlands. You can study full-time or part-time and as single or joint honours. Follow the link in the episode description to learn more. Let's return to the late 1100s. Life was very interesting back then, especially in Huntley, or, as it was known back in the day, the spectacular Strathbogie. Strathbogie? Strathbogie, yes. And this wonderful name comes from the fact that the location of the castle was chosen as a strategic viewpoint, looking out across the place where the River Deveron meets the River Bogie. The first castle would have been called the Peel of Strathbogie. It just keeps getting better. <laughs> Peel means timbered enclosure, and it usually indicates that there's a palisade, a big wall made of tree stakes that completely surrounds the buildings. So it's a really impressive fence, right? Oh, uh, yeah, the most impressive fence. A peel wall is composed of huge pieces of timber staked deep into the earth. It's a difficult, but not impossible, wall to get past. But, because it is completely made of wood, it is vulnerable to fire and siege weapons. I feel like the 1100s are really not my age. Not only do we have to live in a place called the Peel of Strathbogie, <laughs> we've just learned that our castle has a wonderful wooden wall, and it's already under siege. Fear not, little coward Annie, because you also have earthworks to protect your fortification. You've thought carefully in advance, and you've ordered all of your people to dig and haul, and dig and haul, and dig and haul. And together... Your community has made a big, impressive mound of earth to build your fort upon. 
So you aren't just protected by the peel, you are also atop an artificial man-made hill. Okay, now this makes sense because nowadays, while there's not really anything left of the wooden structure of the original castle, you can still see the earthworks. So that's where they hand-built this huge mound. This was a Mott and Bailey castle, a very popular medieval design for military defence. Yes, and this is one of the few things that I remember vividly from school history. Your hill is your Mott or the mound, and atop this Mott is where the most powerful family lives in safety. And then the Bailey is an enclosed courtyard at the foot of the mound which is also protected by the peel walls, which go around the outside. The bailey is where you get the real life of the scene. There's going to be a great hall there, stables, a chapel. It's basically a little village inside of a big old wall. The vast majority of buildings within this structure were made of wood, so that's why the only leftovers from this 12th century Mott and Bailey castle in the 21st century is a big mound. So if you visit Huntley Castle nowadays, all of the stone buildings are where the original bailey would have been, and then the conical mound is the mott, as Jenny's saying. So now we know what the structure looked like. What was life inside and outside this castle like? Well, at this time, Scotland is still finding her identity as a newly formed nation, and the north of Scotland has some pretty dynamic politics. So let's go right back in time to before the mound was built to find out how this location became a centre of power in the first place. Who picked this bogey and flicked a castle onto it? (laughs) The 12th century, the 1100s, are a time period that shapes the north of Scotland in several ways. In Murray, which is an area of rich agricultural lands in the northeast of Scotland, there are some major politics going on. Because up until 1130, Murray was a bit of an ambiguous kingdom in its own right, a kind of semi-independent province of Scotland. There's a wee bit of debate about how self-governing the area of Murray really was, but its leaders are sometimes named as kings in the records, So I'm quite happy to call it the Kingdom of Murray. Is that just because you're from the Murray Coast, Annie? (laughs) You mean the Kingdom of the Murray Coast. (laughs) But you're not a kingdom anymore, are you? Because of what happened in 1130. Because of what happened in 1130. (laughs) Okay, well, I guess you're still a bit sore about this, so I'll tell the listeners this bit. In 1130, the last king of Murray was killed in battle by one of King David I's generals. After this, Murray was sucked into the rest of Scotland to be a kingdom never again. Never say never. <laughs> I would I would absolutely love for Murray to peel off and join Norway along with Orkney. <laughs> <laughs> but even after this defeat, Murray was still a big powerhouse in medieval Scotland and Strathbogie or Huntley as we know it today was very well geographically placed for a defensive structure and so enter King William the Lion who reigns from 1165 to 1214 an incredibly long time for those days or in any period of history really In Gaelic, he's nicknamed Gareth, or the rough, and that's just one of my favourite Gaelic words, full stop. (laughs) And it probably tells you quite a good bit about William the Lion's character and how he managed to rule for so long. At this time, the north of Scotland was still a difficult place to control. And during William the Lion's reign, the population rebels and we see insurrections and revolt across the area. However, William manages to end these by 1187. Some historians believe that this is the date that Strathbogie was granted to Duncan II, Earl of Fife, who was very high in the clan Macduff, possibly a chief. Earl Duncan and the Macduffs had been supportive of William the Lion during the uprisings, And what finer way to thank them than gifting them the lovely Strathbogie? 
But what we can deduce is that William the Lion was trusting Earl Duncan to create a much required stronghold in the rebellious north of Scotland. So that's one version of the history of how Earl Duncan came to control Strathbogie. But the truth is that we don't 100% know when the Scottish monarch gave Strathbogie to that family, though it did happen. The nearby equivalent lordships were handed out before 1187. So there's a good chance that this Strathbogie title was actually assigned before that date. Historians don't really like consensus, do they? Ah, Jenny, the ambiguity of history is what makes it marvellous. Now, we have over 800 stormy years of history between now and then for the clouds to block our view. But what I like about the version of history that's all about crushing the revolt of Northern Scotland is that it gives us a really good view of the political climate. We're reminded that allegiances in the North were of critical importance to the monarch of Scotland. The Earl of Strathbogie, or the Strathbogies as I like to call them, took up popular activities of wealthy people in the 12th and 13th centuries. For example, David of Strathbogie joined the Eighth Crusade, led by King Louis IX of France. If you know your crusader top trumps, uh, King Louis IX might not have been the person that you wanted to lead you in the Eighth Crusade, as he had just lost the Seventh Crusade. They're on a rebound. They're on a rebound crusade. That's what this is. Imagine having the confidence of a French king named Louis. Like any of them. (laughs) If at first your crusade fails, then crusade again and again. And that is how David of Strathbogie died in Tunisia in 1270. So, yeah. (laughs) Although the north of Scotland is often perceived as being isolated and insular, The opposite is true here. It's so easy to forget that the north of Scotland was involved, like much of Europe, in the Crusades. The reality here is that we've got a Scottish noble following a French king on an international religious war to North Africa. How very isolated and insular of him. (laughs) I mean, Jenny, the mindset of the Crusades is isolated and insular, but yet the geography of the Crusades is geographically very far spread. But beyond the Crusades, David's son, John of Strathbogie, also played games of power, right? Oh, yes, he did. Just a wee warning that this John of Strathbogie's history is quite gnarly and violent, so please listen with care. David's son John fought on the Scottish side against the English during the First War of Independence, but he was captured at the Battle of Dunbar in 1296. Being a man with a castle, John was a very valuable prisoner, and so he was taken to the Tower of London and held there for a year. Eventually, he was released, but only after agreeing to serve the English king, which he did do for a short time, but within a decade, he had charged back to Scotland to support Robert the Bruce against the English once more and was even present at Bruce's coronation. Love that for him. His heart called him back to Scotland. Yes, while this does make him a legend, it also makes him very dead. Because you know that old phrase, right? If the English king catches you in a battle for independence and doesn't kill you, then don't get caught again. I haven't heard that one, Jenny. Well, it's solid advice, because not long after Robert the Bruce's coronation in 1306, John of Strathbogie followed him into another battle defending Scotland from English invasion. Unfortunately for John, the Scottish lost the Battle of Methven, However, once again, John de Strathbogie, 9th Earl of Athol, was saved by his very impressive name. Because people in positions of high power love other people with long and important names. And so he was once again taken hostage. And you know what they say, Annie. Capture me once, shame on me. Capture me twice, um, I'm probably dead. I do know that one. I think that was used by Shakespeare. <laughs> Well, the English king was particularly furious at John of Strathbogie, 
not only because of the multiple layers of betrayal, but also because of the fact that they were technically blood relations. They were cousins. Sympathisers for Strathbogie used this to really try and convince the English king that he couldn't go about hanging people who have royal blood. And while the king listened to this, he was torn by the traitorous nature of his cousin. Strathbogie had sworn fealty to him and broken it quite spectacularly. So does the king have mercy on Strathbogie? In a brutal and slightly nepotistical medieval way. See, Edward I decided that because of his royal blood, Earl John should not be hung, drawn and quartered. Hooray! But he should still be hung and quartered. Oh nay. So this means that Strathbogie is avoiding being drawn. To be hung, drawn and quartered was a brutal medieval execution method. It was saved for those convicted of high treason, the crimes most threatening to the king. So to prevent disloyalty against the king, they made a spectacle of highly painful executions. This method was to be hung until almost dead, And then the drawn part means disembowelment of a person whilst they are still alive. Their organs would often be tossed into a fire pit in front of them whilst they were half alive, half hanging. And then the quartering part is butchering the body into different sections. To be drawn is the disembowelment part of this, which, I mean, if you can get out of that, then... It's good to get out of that, but it's still going to be a nasty execution. John Strathbogie was sentenced to death. He was hung, tortured and beheaded. John's head was then placed on London Bridge and his torso, flesh and bones were burned. That royal blood really didn't do that much for him, did it? No, didn't save him in the end. But where's the nepotism you mentioned? I thought that we were going to get more mercy here. Well, because it is very unusual for such a high-ranking noble to be hung in medieval London, they decided they'd show some respect for his noble blood. And so when they were hanging him, the structure they used was 30 feet higher than normal. What a privilege. I know, Annie. Talk about high status. The lands of Strathbogie and the castle passed on to John's son, Earl David II. Just a year later, in the winter of 1307, Robert the Bruce visited Strathbogie Castle. We're not sure why the Scottish warrior king sought refuge in Strathbogie, but we know he was either injured or ill and needed to recover. And of course, the Strathbogies take him in and are still loyal to him. Now, if you're walking round the mound of the old castle site, Imagine that you're walking in the footsteps of a great warrior king. However, after Robert the Bruce departed Strathbogie, Earl David II switched sides to the English. So that loyalty seems to have flown out the window fairly quickly. But he is a bit of a flip-flopper and later comes back to support King Robert the Bruce. No one likes an indecisive earl. This is very true, because the problem with being a flip-flopper in war is that no one trusts you. And in Earl David II of Strathbogie's case, this is very justified. Because he betrayed Scotland one final time by switching back to support the English. However, his timing is appalling, as just afterwards, Robert the Bruce epically wins at the Battle of Bannockburn which was a huge victory for Scotland against the English, so big that it's the battle that our national anthem is still about. Robert didn't appreciate Earl David being a wiggly wee traitor, and so he rightly banished him and seized all of his Scottish lands and properties. Among this was the Mott and Bailey Castle of Strathbogie. The lands and properties were reassigned amongst those in favour of Robert the Bruce and he granted the lordship of Strathbogie to Sir Adam Gordon of Huntley in Berwickshire. And so, exit the era of the self-sabotaging Strathbogies and enter the new lords of Strathbogie, the Gordon dynasty. Man, the Strathbogies really blew it. (laughs) (laughs) 
Catch it in a tissue, Jenny. The age of the gardens in the castle of Strathbogie is turbulent but thrilling. The Garden Dynasty oversaw several transformations of the castle that give us the vast majority of the ruins that are left over today. We are entering into a few hundred years of intriguing political positioning and astounding architecture. This architectural ambition is part of the identity of the Gordons. It serves as a means for them to showcase their growing influence, success and power. They choose styles of buildings that are not simply practical, but that also tie them to broader, powerful players in Scotland and Europe. It's like if you see someone that you really admire with a sage green kitchen and you go home and paint your kitchen sage green, except with European rich families. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> First big building project at Strathbogie was deciding to switch from having a castle made of wood to having one made of stone. So the gardens replaced the old timber castle, which was too 13th century for them, with a strong, mighty Alpan tower house made of stone in 1375. In fairness to the Gordons, it is much harder for wolves to huff, puff and blow your castle down if it is made of stone rather than timber. Not much remains of this Alpland tower house except the foundations. However, in the 15th century, we begin to see some awe-inspiring developments. And we also witness the Gordon family being tightly woven into the politics of the Scottish monarchy. Now there's far too much to go into in one episode, but a good example of their favour with the crown was that in 1440, Sir Alexander Seaton of Gordon was chosen to carry the heart of the deceased King James I of Scotland to Jerusalem. He managed to get the heart to Jerusalem, but then he died on the return journey. Hmm. Such is the perils of carrying a king's heart to Jerusalem. This little slice of history shows us that the Gordons were trusted with what was considered a sacred relic of the king's body. And it shows us just how close they were to the crown. As we enter into the mid to late 15th century, the Gordons are making their seat in Strathbogie reflect their status. A huge hall and chamber block was built, and this was frequently visited by King James IV himself. And then, finally, in 1506, the name of the castle was legally changed from Strathbogie to Huntley by royal charter. They finally sneezed out that Strathbogie that had been bothering them for so long. The name Huntley comes from the Gordons, whose land in the Scottish borders included a village in their Berwickshire estate called Huntley. However, you need not fear of finding yourself in the wrong Huntley, as the Berwickshire village mysteriously disappeared off the maps. That's suspicious. Other Huntleys did pop up centuries later in Australia, America and Canada. I mean, that's just colonisation. But the original Huntley in the Scottish borders is lost to the mists of time. But now we have our lovely Huntley Castle in Aberdeenshire. Well, a lot of people did still call it Strathbogie for a couple of centuries afterwards, just to annoy the Gordons, which I love. <laughs> That's such a shame. It's like when you do something embarrassing in your first year of school and it haunts you throughout all of your life. <laughs> when you have a really rubbish nickname and you just can't shake it off no matter how hard you try. <laughs> However, along with a new name, the gardens give Huntley Castle a big glow up. From a defensive fort-like castle to an impressive palace... Yes, because in 1550, George Gordon, the fourth Earl of Huntley, accompanied Queen Regent Mary of Guise to France. Mary of Guise was Mary Queen of Scots' mum. And many believe that the fourth Earl of Huntley was inspired by the Chateau of Renaissance France. 
So when he got back to the one true Huntley, he enacted a massive overhaul of his castle. Upon the vaults of the earlier structure, he rebuilt the great hall and chamber block magnificently. The storage vaults are incredibly practical at Huntley Castle. I visited them on a warm day and the vaults were a steady cool temperature. Perfect for keeping perishable foods for longer or for keeping your wine in pristine condition. Then if you climb the stairs, you can walk amongst the grander rooms of the Great Hall and the bed chambers, though they aren't as stunning as they would have been under his vision. The exposed stone walls would have been decorated with stunningly bright plasters, painted in beautiful colours, and hung with lavish tapestries. It was so exquisite that when Mary of Guise was entertained on a visit to Huntley Palace, she was so stunned and overwhelmed by its beauty that the monarchs of Scotland became a little cautious about the power of the gardens in the north of Scotland. Perhaps Huntley Palace was a statement too far. They called the Earl of Gordon the Cock of the North, as though he was a great cockerel strutting around and cockle-doodle-doing all of his might. And, upon seeing his display, they considered that they might have to clip his wings. The English ambassador to Scotland described Huntley Palace as The best furnished of any house I have seen in this country. Not just this, but the palace was also decorated with outwardly Catholic iconography, which situated the Gordon family in the Catholic religious camp during the Reformation. Just a memo for anyone who forgets the Reformation, which, I mean, none of us do, but just in case. That was the period in Western Christianity when people fought over whether they would follow the traditions of the Catholic Church or the new ideas of the Protestant faith. So it's about whether or not they should reform their religious beliefs. Different countries in Europe had wildly different responses to this, but it resulted in a lot of turmoil, from religious persecutions to civil wars. If anyone remembers the Slane's Castle episode, they'll know that the Gordons of Huntley, along with the Errols of Slane's, were leaders in Catholic uprisings. And since I remember that episode so well, I remember that's how Slane's Castle got blown up with gunpowder and shovels. Because their uprisings had really displeased King James VI. Oh no, is dear King James VI going to get his shovels out again? Yes, however the historical record doesn't quite match the castle. Obviously, King James VI was feeling very betrayed by the uprising earls. The records describe that he was deliberating what to do with their castles when they were in exile. James VI decides to destroy Huntley Castle first. This comes from the calendar of state papers for 1594. So that's the documents of the government. And these tell us about the destruction. It calls the people dismantling the castle pioneers, but it means this word in a military sense, not in a kind of tech bro sense. They're the people in the military who bring the spades. The pioneers have wrought for two days to raise the house of Strathbogie. Nothing thereof is left undamaged save the great old tower, which shall be blown up with gunpowder. The house, being fourteen years in building, shall be cast down and made equal with the ground in two days, and all men are made free to the spoils thereof. So we do know that there was plenty of castle that was left undamaged, because there's still a multi-storey castle on the site, showing construction from different centuries. It was never made equal with the earth. George Gordon returns from exile in the late 1590s, and he declares his allegiance to James VI, and he's given the title of Marquis, or as it's said in France, and I think also America, Marquis. And upon his return and fancy new title, 
George Gordon rebuilds his castle to be prouder than ever before, adding a grand inscription to the front of the castle, celebrating his and his wife's rise in status as Marquis and Marchioness, carving these words in big letters across the castle. He also had a little thing underneath with the phonetic pronunciation of them. <laughs> <laughs> he did not. <laughs> not just that, he carves a wee stone hand pointing to the names. And this little hand gets called the hand of God. Because of course, God would acknowledge that the Earl is now a Marquis. I know that religions across the world have massively different interpretations of what a god might look like. But for the Marquis of Huntley, he has big sausage fingers made of stone. <laughs> <laughs> However, not all sources call it the hand of God, so Huntley might have just really enjoyed pointing at his own success. If I had a big old castle, I would carve the paw of my puppy in the wall because she's so cute and it's so small and fluffy. Well, your puppy may have enjoyed my favourite part of the castle, which is, of course, the bakehouse and the brew house, which are next door to each other, and they stand just opposite the main site of the castle. These two buildings need a special shout-out, as they are one of the places that, for me, brings the castle to life. These are practical buildings, showing us how the castle ate and drank. Inside the bakehouse... There are remnants of the two great beehive ovens, which would have been used to bake the bread. These ovens would have been heated up from the inside, so they would build a fire on top of the bricks, likely using peat or wood. And then, when the fire started to fade, but the bricks were still very hot, the baker would clear out the ashes and chuck in the dough. Mm -mm -mm. Char grilled medieval bread. Gotta love it. They would use a big paddle to get the bread in and out of the oven. It's very similar to what you would see being used in a pizza oven nowadays. Mm -mm -mm. Char grilled medieval pizza. Gotta love it. <laughs> I mean, we're more likely to be eating barley bread or oat bread, but they would have also cooked pastries and cakes in this bakery. Mm, 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 mm. Char grilled medieval croissants. Gotta love it. <laughs> and then there's the convenient brewery next door, where they would be making delicious ale for everyone in the castle. It would be weaker than the ale that we have nowadays, so they could drink much more of it. However, again with the international collections, the Earl or Marquis would be drinking wine imported from mainland Europe. However, what I love about these buildings is that both the bakehouse and the brew house were built for purpose. And just by walking around them from the remaining ruins, you can see how they would have worked. You can picture in your mind's eye a bustling courtyard outside the castle, filled with chickens and goats and people going about their lives as the castle grows. The people who really make the castle work by working Visitors to the castle may be bowled over by the impressive bakehouse. As I was. Or they may instead marvel at the stunning carvings on both the exterior and interior of the castle. There's a spectacular fireplace inside, with engravings of the Marquis and Marchioness surrounded by a ton of heraldry. The coats of arms for James VI, the Gordons and the Lennoxes. There is also a spectacular front piece above the door of Huntley Castle, rich with symbolism. Look out for the Scottish unicorn and the Danish dragon, representing King James VI, and his wife Anne of Denmark, Queen of Scotland. So when he comes back from his exile, he really literally carves in stone his new allegiance to the king. I mean, he has to show his king his extreme loyalty, you know? He's not just following him on Instagram. He's liking all of his posts. He's sharing <laughs> them. He's copying things that the king does. And these carvings are just one of many acknowledgements from the Huntleys that they know they only have this castle through the grace of the king. However, if anyone is visiting the castle, 
they may notice some damage to the castle carvings. That was done in 1640, when the Catholic iconography was chipped off by Covenanters. The Covenanters wanted to rid the world of this kind of religious art that they believed reminded people too much of the Catholic Church. And they left behind just chipped panels. It makes me very sad because often this art tells us so much about people and their beliefs. And now we just have a chipped wall. But beyond this destroyed artwork, the Reformation also came and chipped away the reputation of the openly Catholic Gordons. This had some strange and spooky consequences. But before we get into them... Let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. Annie, of all the lovely listeners listening right now, how many do you think like learning about the language, heritage, archaeology, literature, landscape, identity, folklore and magic of Scotland's Highlands and Islands? Every single one. Well, do I have a course for all of you lovely listeners. Because the University of the Highlands and Islands Culture and Heritage BA Honours Course is an interdisciplinary degree that explores all of these topics and more. This degree is an incredible opportunity to gain a deep understanding of the rich heritage that has built this region. It's offered as an online course and internationally accredited. So no matter where you are in the world, near or far, land or sea, This course is a path to understanding the beating heart of the Highlands. You can study full-time or part-time and as single or joint honours. Follow the link in the episode description to learn more. Okay, we have the very powerful Gardens of Huntley who had peaks and troughs of devoutness in their Catholic faith during a time when Catholics were being persecuted. So how does the Reformation affect the family? In stranger ways than you may think. Like most ancient castles in Scotland, Huntley has a fair few ghosts floating around its halls and through its walls. Most of the ghosts are pretty run-of-the-mill ghost stories that we see in a lot of Scottish castles. For example... The castle is said to be haunted by a green lady. She was a young lady who became pregnant with a child out of wedlock. The father refused to marry her or even accept responsibility. And so, distraught and desperate, the woman took her own life and has walked the halls mournfully ever since. This is a tragic tale and unfortunately it's one that seems to have played out in many places. Lots of castles have green or grey ladies haunting them and many of them have similar backstories to this one. Just about how structures of power try to control women's bodies and refuse to just let them exist in the world in a way that seems natural. But Huntley Castle also has a spectacular supernatural tale from the mid-1500s right in the middle of the Reformation. And what's so interesting about this is that the story was recorded around the time that it actually happened by a fellow named Richard Bannatyne in a manuscript called Memorials of Transactions in Scotland, 1569 to 1573. We read a transcribed version edited by scholar Robert Pitcairn. So it's written in Old Scots, which might be quite hard to understand for a lot of listeners. So I think we'll do our best to translate the original text. The story goes that George Gordon, the 5th Earl of Huntley, and some of his friends went down to the castle grounds to partake in a friendly five-a-side football match. Fun fact, the football would have been made with an inflated animal bladder wrapped in leather. In the middle of the game, the Earl suddenly fell to the ground. He arose and stumbled over to a peat stack and said, I believe I shall not play any more at this time. I am sick. Bring me my cloak. And so they wrapped him in his cloak and he started to make his way back to the castle. But he barely made it a few steps before he stumbled. 
His acquaintances ran after him, held his arms and helped him up. And before they reached the castle, the Earl seemed a bit more stable and steady, so they let go of his arms. But the Earl took a few steps and then his cloak fell from his shoulders and he too fell face first into a muddy puddle. The men rushed over, picked him up, carried him to his chamber and lay him on his bed. But as soon as they put him down, the Earl began foaming not only at the mouth, but also out of both of his nostrils. He was waving his arms around and his body was contorting. His eyes were rolling back and he vomited something like black soot. And all that he could say was, look, 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 over and over again. He was like this until seven in the evening, when finally he breathed his last breath, as was the will of God. This sounds pretty horrifying. I think it's that they don't have the medical expertise or knowledge at this time to be able to understand what's happening to him. So it must be really shocking for anyone witnessing it because they don't have the science to explain it. And this was shocking. It came out of the blue and it was very violent and all the men were very shaken by it. But his terrible demise wasn't all. For as Bannantyne says, after this, strange things were seen in that place. After the Earl's death, the remaining 15 or so men gathered in a chamber together and stayed up till the early hours, reflecting on the harm that would come as a result of his death and their own mortality. A man from the West Coast was lamenting on his own precarious life position when all of a sudden, he collapsed to the ground as if dead. The other men took him to a window to get some air and then they carried him to bed. After an hour or so, he awoke and seemed physically fine, but he was shivering, sobbing and wringing his hands whilst repeating over and over again, cold, cold, cold. I think this sounds psychological. I mean, maybe he was just in shock over witnessing this horrible death. Ah, it's possible. It is possible, Annie. But it doesn't end there. Because a few days later, a man called John Hamilton was opening a chest when he suddenly exclaimed, Oh, I am very sick! and fell to the ground, crying, Cold! Cold! Again, the men took him to his bed where he shivered and wrung his hands and complained incessantly about how cold he was. When the men who were helping him went back downstairs, they found a third man had collapsed over the very same chest that John Hamilton had just collapsed on. He too was taken to bed, where he too writhed and wrung his hands and complained and complained of a terrible, terrible cold. Wow, these men fall like dominoes. We have three men mysteriously collapsed with the same symptoms and taken to bed since the Earl's death. How very odd. It is. And I don't know about you, Annie. Actually, I do know about you. But for me, it feels like something spooky is afoot. And things get even odder still. The account continues that on the Wednesday after the death, the Earl's body was placed in a locked chamber in the chapel. The Earl's brother was sitting on a bench outside the room when he heard a great commotion coming from inside the locked room. There was groaning and rumbling voices and shouts coming from within the chamber. He called a group of men to the door who all heard the noises too. And so the brother and another man unlocked the room and cautiously entered. Although dark, they could see nothing untoward. But the loud, disconcerting grunting and grinding noises continued and they fled the room terrified. The noises carried on for more than an hour, and candles were brought to the chamber. But again, those brave enough to go inside could not find the source of the grunts and groans. And it was said that the room was so well sealed that not even a mouse could enter it. But, as we know, spirits need not keys to enter a locked room. Not soon after, the Earl was laid to rest and the three men made a full recovery. But the strange mystery surrounding the Earl's death 
spread like wildfire between the poor and wealthy alike. In time, the whole incident was glossed over and the story was changed so that it seemed like the Earl died a perfect, peaceful, very much unhaunted death. You can still visit the chapel to this day, so if you are in there, please do some ghost hunting on Jenny's behalf. (laughs) This is a really interesting story, especially as it was written down so soon after the events happened. But Bannatyne does say that he heard it from a gentle woman who heard it from a gentle man who was present at the deaths and collapses. So, in other words, along ye olde gossipy grapevine. Uh, ye olde ghostly gossipy grapevine. Thank you very much. This is where I differ to you, Jenny. This and many other places. (laughs) Because what I find really fascinating about this story is not the supernatural aspect, but rather the last paragraph that you chose to leave out of your retelling, where Bannatine states... Oh man, I've been rumbled. <laughs> That's not what he states, Jenny. Stick to the... <laughs> That's my statement. <laughs> Stick to the story, Jenny. I praise the Lord my God and bless his holy name forever and ever when I behold the five who were involved in the conspiracy. Not only the murder of the king and the second regent, who was the king's grandfather, but also the murder of the first regent, of which I have some knowledge. Four have already faced punishment, lacking sufficient provision. Namely, the Secretary, Argyle, Bothwell, and lastly, Huntley. I hope that the fifth will die more justly and confess their evil deeds with their own words, repenting at the foot of the gallows. I'll be honest with you, Annie, I left this out because it didn't have any more spooky, unexplained incidents in it, and I'm just here for the ghosts. (laughs) Well, Jenny, I'm here for the gossip and the reformation, (laughs) because this final paragraph actually tells us quite a lot about why Bannatyne thought that a ghost story was so important to write down. He was recording this incident at a time of high religious and political tension. Mary, Queen of Scots, the Catholic monarch of Scotland, had been forced to abdicate by her cousin, England's Elizabeth I. In Mary's place, her infant son, James VI, took the throne. But James VI was to be raised as a Protestant. Many of the Gordon family were openly Catholic, and thus they were supporters of Mary, Queen of Scots, though they sometimes had very funny ways of showing it. In the same way that a cat who loves you might bring you a dead mouse. Bannatyne is accusing the late Earl of Huntley of being one of the five powerful Scottish men who were suspected of three murders. Huntley was suspected of these murders because he was an expert conspirator. Though he had more distance to some of the murders than the others. The murders in question are those of the King Consort, Lord Darnley, who was the second husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, and then the murder of the first two regents after Mary, Queen of Scots, is forced to abdicate. The regents were the people who controlled Scotland on behalf of James VI whilst he was busy growing milk teeth and learning to walk. The first regent of James VI's rule was assassinated and the second regent was killed in a skirmish. While Huntley didn't pull either trigger, many suspected that he was somehow involved in all three deaths. It seems that Bannatyne believed that the death of Huntley and then the suffering that his pals endured from the hauntings could be interpreted as a punishment from God for their corrupt, murderous morals, and by extension, their Catholicism. However, I think it's Bannatyne who's being corrupt in this case. He's exploiting Huntley's sudden death to write some mean things about him in the historical record. Bannatyne is opportunistically 
trying to use a scary supernatural story as propaganda against Catholicism. What we think in the modern day, how we interpret the Earl of Huntley's death, is by stroke, which is the most common reason that people think it could be, or possibly by food poisoning. So it definitely wasn't a punishment from God. Okay, but I don't think it was God. I think it was ghosts. Well, if you encounter his ghost at Huntley Castle, Jenny, then maybe you can ask him. I will. I will. There's such a wide history of Huntley Palace in the 1600s that we'll need to return to maybe looking at the broader region in this time period because it's a very exciting ride. But I don't think we've got enough time in this episode to go for all of it. So I'll give you some key points. Huntley Palace stopped being a residence at some point after the civil wars of the 1640s. We're not quite sure when, but I'm thinking the later 1600s. And then we know that Huntley Palace was occupied by British government troops during the 1745 Jacobite Rising. In 1752, Duchess Catherine, the widow of the third Duke of Gordon, built Huntley Lodge using stone from the castle, which is partially why the castle is now in such a ruinous state. The bricks of history became a quarry for future builds, and so we're quite fortunate that we have as much of the castle or the palace remaining as we do. Huntley has an incredibly long and interesting history full of fascinating historical characters. And while, unfortunately, we couldn't cover all of them in this episode, there is one last individual that I'd like to talk about, and that is the castle's current resident. Current and cutest. Yes, by far the cutest. Sorry, Gordon family. Because despite being in ruins, the castle is still home to one last soul. A very regal cat named Buster. I love Buster. Technically, Buster's owners live in the town of Huntley. But a few years ago, Buster decided that he'd rather split his time between his village home and the vaults of Huntley Castle. So he just claimed the castle as his own. And because there are so many rooms to choose from, he ended up with not one cat bed in Huntley Castle, but with two in different vaults. He's spoiled for choice, and spoiled by the staff and volunteers of the castle, who feed him as part of their custodianship of the site. His black and white markings make it look like he's wearing a very finely tailored suit, and he has a wonderfully aristocratic face. And I don't know how these things work, Annie, but I reckon we can petition to get him the title of Earl of Huntley. It definitely doesn't work by petition, that's for sure. (laughs) But I think we can give him the honorary title of Buster, the first Marquis Mouse Hunter of Huntley Castle. All in favour? Aye. (laughs) All right. Well, on that marvellous note, Thank you all so much for listening to Stories of Scotland. If you haven't already, we would really love for you to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, especially if you are in Australia, because we love Australia and knowing we have listeners all the way on the other side of the world brings us so much joy. You can also support us as we make this wee show by joining our Patreon. Patreon is a wonderful way to support your favourite independent creators and your help allows us to keep making this podcast. If you head over to www.patreon.com slash stories of Scotland, you can sign up and not only help us out, but also gain access to lots of weird and wonderful little stories of Scottish history and folklore. A massive thank you to all our newest patrons, you wonderful people. Mac, Joanne, Andrea, Catherine, Trevor, Jan, John and Kelsey. 
Thank you all so much. I put up a Patreon the other day that I really loved about a weird murder mystery from the 1830s, which also <laughs> has a spooky twist to it. You guys know me. <laughs> so join up if you'd like to hear that story. Thank you all so, so much. We really, really appreciate your support. Um, we couldn't make this podcast at all without you. So I like to imagine us all as goblins. Not just any goblins, but as written by a writer who happens to be from Huntley, George MacDonald. These goblins once lived above the ground, and they were like other people, you know, just a little bit goblin-y. But then the king started severely taxing us goblins, and imposing stricter laws against goblin kind. And so we disappeared, we vanished. Across the country, you would never again see a goblin. According to the legend, however, we had taken refuge in subterranean caverns. We had moved underground. Exiled from the surface of the globe, we built our own world full of joy, laughter and excitement. In this under-earth, the heart of the goblin city is a grand cavern. It's illuminated by a thousand twinkling gems embedded in the rock, which cast colourful lights across the space. This cavern is a feasting hall, where we eat our delicious goblin underground foods, such as fungi and um, <laughs> roots and baked crystals, and <laughs> we drink goblinade and... <laughs> <laughs> All right, until next time, Slangeva. Slangeva. Because they're the lightest on my little palate. <laughs> my, my delicate palate. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen you as delicate palated, Jenny. Yeah, I'm not good. I'm not good with anything other than like <laughs> bread. The first castle would have been called the Peel of Strathbogie. It just keeps getting better. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps getting better, Jenny? I just, I'm sitting here with two fingers up my nose right now. <laughs> <laughs> getting into character. <laughs> you disgust me, Jenny. <laughs> um, so I reluctantly and very carefully checked the reviews and like six or seven new ones have come in and they're all great. That's really nice. That's really nice to hear. Let me read you, let me read you two before we start, we continue back on. Happy place, five stars. You two are my happy place. You bring a smile no matter how bad of a mood I started in. The way you weave folklore and facts together keeps me excited for every new episode. Thanks and keep up the awesome podcast. Oh, what a star. What an absolute star. Um, love this podcast, five stars. You two are brilliant. Learning about the Highlands from you is so much fun. Thanks for an informative and entertaining podcast. Aww. Delightful. This is wholesome and fun. Oh, great. Yes, nice. Five in a day. <laughs> Thank you, Apple. Um, did you see okay. the message on Patreon that was like, whenever Annie gives a content warning, my five-year-old and my ten-year-old laugh hysterically? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so apparently I'm more sensitive than a five-year-old child. <laughs> that this John of Strathbogie's history is quite gnarly and violent. So please listen with care. <laughs> Cue five-year-olds cackling. <laughs> <laughs> In the same way that a cat who loves you might bring you a dead mouse. They brought her the body of her dead husband. <laughs> and she played with it on the doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> They didn't do that, but that's that's not what I should say. 